So today we're going to do this text from Bruce Trigger, The Birth of the Huron. Uh, we're going to get through the entire text, however long that takes us, in the detail that we need in order to understand it. And then I'm actually going to post this recording online for the benefit of the other sections of this class uh, as part of the asynchronous content uh, for, this, for this course. So that's why we're going to be doing this, this exercise in the way that we're, we're doing it. So we're going to look like we're going to, I'm going to start with a couple of introductory remarks and then we're going to jump into the text. Today's class will be especially useful if you plan on submitting the module two essay that is pertinent to this text. And if you plan to do so, hopefully by the time we get through the material today, you'll have a very good idea of how to answer the, the, the topic question that I've set where it's relevant to this, particular, to this particular text. The last time we were together, we worked through together the text from, I believe it was Polanyi. Uh, so it's a similar kind of exercise. We're going to go through this and try and explicate it to understand what it is exactly that we are reading, right? So with your permission, that's going to be our agenda today. Okay, so today, having uh, dealt with many of the basic themes that we looked at in Module 1, we looked at this question of uh, societies without markets, uh, and we looked at the Polanyi thesis, right, that we've inherited a point of view in which we are subordinated to a market thinking, and then Polanyi's point that most of human history has not, in fact, been like that, that markets have traditionally been subordinated to the social function. We explored that concept uh, in, no, in some considerable detail the last time that we were together uh, last week. So picking up on that, I'd like to, um, to sort of make a kind of fundamental observation. And let me share my screen. So we saw last time, right, we talked about Salins, the original affluent society. This is the topic of the first essay that some of you are going to be writing. We looked at planning. We saw the principles of reciprocity and redistribution, right? We saw those concepts that Polanyi puts, uh, puts forward. We noted that the logic of exchange in uh, pre-modern terms is not circumscribed, not circumscribed by what we would call a market logic, but instead by a social logic, right? And I mentioned, uh, at least in passing, that there are examples of markets that take place, or markets that exist, forms of exchange that are institutionalized through markets that nonetheless don't have clear, what we would call economic outcomes. They have social outcomes, and the best example, and the one that we'll look at, is the so-called cooler rate, which we're going to come back to uh, next time. Today, what I want to do is I want to make a proposition to you that when we think about the role of or this relationship between societies and markets outside of our current modern sort of uh, free market or, 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 or self-regulating market logic, that markets can affect societies in two ways, right? So once we've in, entered into an environment where we have some kind of surplus resources that we can use to facilitate exchange. Because remember, that's the premise from Salins, that primitive communities only produce what they need, so therefore there's no possibility for any kind of an exchange economy because there's no surplus goods to exchange. But once we start developing surplus resources, we have the capacity for some kind of an exchange economy, even if the utility value of those surplus resources may strike us as being somewhat odd or unusual. Once we've got then that sort of, as it were, first requirement, we're generating some kind of a surplus, and now we have the possibility for markets to emerge, I want to suggest that we can think of these market institutions in two ways, that they can affect us in two effects, they have social, they have a social effect in one of two ways. They can either work as an exogenous force, that is to say from the outside, exogenous meaning from the outside, uh, exogenous force that defines the broad parameters of a society, or they can serve an endogenous logic, meaning something that's happening inside the society that's helping to shape, reinforce, or otherwise define social institutions. This second one, the endogenous logic, we're going to pick up on when we uh, turn to our consideration in the Malinowski text of the Kula Ring. Today, what we're going to do is look at this first one, this question of how can we understand markets as an exogenous force that defines the broad parameters of society. This is what the Huron text that we're going to look at today helps us to explore. Okay, so what we're going to look at then is this so-called exogenous market logic. We're going to look at the chapter from this book, The Children of Atta Insik. Uh, and what we're looking at then is this world of indigenous North Americans, right? That's the 
That's the environment that we're in. And actually, I have a better series of maps than the one I put up here. So what we're going to look at, right, is the development of what are called the Huron. The Huron were an indigenous uh, society in North America. Uh, and you may know that Lake Huron is one of the great lakes of North America, right? Lake Michigan, Lake Superior, etc. Lake Huron is one of them. And they were living up around the Great Lakes. The story that's told to us in this chapter is a very interesting story. It's essentially how does a group or a culture, we might call it a nation, come to be? What makes you or what gives you the possibility to define yourselves as one or another nationality? Not in the modern legal sense or, or, or political sense, but meaning how can you how do you come about in such a way that you are distinct from your neighbors? What makes you Italian? as opposed to Spanish, to choose the example that's sitting here in the room with me today. That's not a question we often think about, and if we were to think about it, it would be very difficult for us to track back, right? Because of the sort of process that creates us as the sort of national identity we have now is uh, complex and generally hidden from view. It's a consequence of many, many complex factors. The advantage of studying the Huron is that it's a small group of people over a long period of time, gradually emerge and form a distinct or a discrete uh, nation. And by nation, again, I don't mean the modern political sense of the word nation. I mean a people who are distinguished by a distinct language, a homogenous culture, their own rituals, their own values, etc. Right, their own way of doing things. That sort of idea of a nation. And we're going to look at them through a very long period of time. And I put down here for your benefit. Again, I'll post these slides. When you're reading this text, uh, the author assumes a certain familiarity with the language and the world of uh, anthropology, and particularly the anthropology of indigenous cultures of North America. That's probably a knowledge that many of us don't have. So by way of assisting you, I put down a couple of these terms. The chapter is long. It's a 70-page chapter. However, there are many elements of this chapter that can simply be ignored. What matters to us is to, to, to select for those elements of the reading that are actually critical to this sort of larger story. And we'll see how that works as we go through, uh, as we go through the reading. Broadly speaking, then, what we're going to do is we're going to track the emergence of this nation, or Trigger is going to track the emergence of this nation, from the earliest periods that we know of, of the indigenous culture of North America, through to what's known as the historic period, which is when the French arrived in this part of North America, and discovered, quote unquote, encountered, maybe is a better word to use, encountered the indigenous cultures that were there, one of which was the Huron. And the point is that by the time the French arrived in the 16th and indeed really more in the 17th century, the French themselves recognized the Huron as a distinct nation. They called them, in fact, Huroni, the nation of the, of the Huron. So by the time the French arrived, it was clear that this was a distinct group. Let's put them into some sort of geographical context uh, so we know a little bit what we're talking about. So let's pull way out. Here is a map that I took from someplace, I don't even remember. Shows us the different kinds of settlement or different kinds of populations that we have in North America, uh, broadly speaking, from people who are living in Mesoamerica into Mexico, Central America, the South, the West, etc. The world that we're looking at is this world here in the eastern, north, northeastern North America, and, the cent and, and, and East Central, right? So below the Great Lakes, right? The part that is colored in green, the so-called Eastern woodlands. Within this area, there are a large number of different uh, indigenous uh, peoples. However, I'll note that many of them speak uh, some variant of the same language, not all of them, suggesting that they are fragmenting, right? From, these, from, from one original group fragmented uh, based on the common language that they share. Okay, let's drill in. So from our big picture of North America, if we drill into the map that you saw before, what you can see is that in the Great Lakes area, up to the St. Lawrence Valley, and then down into New England, even into upstate, uh, through upstate New York into the south, that there are all these different groups which can be specific or specified or designated uh, as distinct from each other, largely based on different languages, not exclusively based on different languages, but largely based on different languages. Um, an, example, an exception to that would be, for example, the five tribes of the Iroquois that we see here, the Seneca, Cayuga, and so on, that live south of Lake Ontario. But broadly speaking, what you can see is there's a lot of different people living in this area. 
This is not the idea of nations as we might understand in a European sense, but it is helpful nonetheless to think of each of these groups as constituting their own nation, in the sense that they saw themselves as distinct from their neighbors. Many of them had languages that were, if not mutually incomprehensible, sufficiently divergent that they could be reasonably uh, called by their own name. Within this group, so this is the general world of Eastern North America, we're going to look at the rise of Huronia, which ultimately ends up occupying, broadly speaking, this area here. So we have this region that it stretches from the west of, uh, from west of Lake Ontario through to uh, the eastern shore of Lake Huron. And Huronia itself was centered around this body of water, which you can see up here at the top of Lake Huron, which is called Georgian Bay. So it's nestled to the north of Toronto around this area of Georgian Bay. And that became the area known as Huronia. And so the question we're going to ask today is, how was it that these groups of people, and here we see drilled in uh, the specific different elements of what was collectively the Huron Nation, how did these people come into being? Right? That's the question that we're going to ask broadly. And then the second question we're going to ask is, why did they end up here? Why, of all places in the world, would they have settled here? And although we seem a very, we see it seems very distant from our theme of markets and society, remember that the overriding question is this idea of exogenous market forces, we will see by the end of our discussion that the idea of a market plays a critical role in the formation, in this case, of a very people. That markets actually help us to see the emergence of a group of people, the Huron, out of this larger mass of indigenous peoples in North America.